you can definitely get people's ass moving and tell them to stop being a bitch about stuff, but it's not going to be a sustainable long-term change. All of the people I know who respond well to this type of motivational content are straight men. You also don't want to be too soft and nurturing and not hold people accountable. We have commodified self-care, we have commercialized it, and we have made it an outcome to achieve. It has permeated through every single arena of our life. Parents struggle with it, people in romantic relations struggle with it. We can't do that because we live in a society that does not value it at all. Who told you you have to have a relationship at X time of your life? And what is it about a relationship you think would benefit your life right now? I don't have any female friends, straight or not, who respond well to this type of stuff. I didn't think the fact that I was going out seven nights a week was a problem. You have this book that is coming out this week called Toxic Productivity, which is probably one of the most relevant topics that I feel like we could be talking about these days. And so, yeah, I'm just really excited to to unpack what all that means. I'm very excited to talk about it. I um, have been writing it for a couple of years. So it's nice mm -hmm. to kind of hear people's reaction and the kind of questions they're asking. It's uh, It's been a very exciting time. Cool. And this is your debut book, right? First book? This is my first book. Yes. Feels so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that as it relates yeah. to productivity, because I know writing mm -hmm. a book you have to have goals. You have, you never quite feel like you're ready to turn it in when it's ready to go in and all the things. But before we get into that, I always like to just give context to someone's body of work, uh, by talking about their upbringing and you mm -hmm. are like a, a double immigrant, right? You, you, were, were you born in, in Bangladesh? No. So I was born in Pakistan. And my family has split time between Pakistan and Bangladesh just for geopolitical reasons. They were one country and then it became right. two countries. Okay. Um, and But I grew up in the Middle East. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Uh -huh. And moved to Toronto, Canada when I was just ending middle school. So I was 13 and probably like the worst time to move a child is right in the middle of middle school. And... Then I, I mean, I grew up halfway in Toronto and I did my master's here in New York City in 2011, lived here for two years, moved back to Toronto and then came back to New York seven years ago. I find that children who grow up in the home of immigrants always have an interesting perspective on the world when it comes to productivity mm -hmm. and achieving mm -hmm. things, um, because that's, that's, that's a very big change in anyone's life and what was the vibe like when you were when you were growing up in your household what kind of uh, ideologies were your parents indoctrinating you with in terms of what to do once you get older and how mm -hmm. to see the world and things like that so i think the culture in our home was very much about doing you are always doing something. Everything you do needs to have kind of like a productive outcome. My mom is very task oriented. So she always has these lists. Um, even on your day off, there's these lists that you have to do. She would often leave it on the kitchen table um, when we were in high school, uh, when she was leaving for work. And even beyond that, you know, when we were younger, we would go back home to Pakistan to, you know, have a summer. It's like summer vacation. But my parents were always doing something. They were always going somewhere. There was things that needed to be attended to. So it was a very much doing environment. And I, I don't necessarily remember major moments of rest, you know, or just hanging out or everything. You just, you know, you're always using your time. My mom is always, she has a very utilitarian perspective on time. And I think that just kind of shaped my work ethic immensely. You mentioned in the book that as a child, you were absorbed in stories, your own yeah. story, as well as reading stories. So talk a little bit about that. How did that relate to the um, culture in your, in your home? Was that something that, that you used to escape? Was it something that you used to kind of make sense of what you're experiencing in the world? I think that, Alex, there's two parts of this. The, the funny 
piece that didn't end up going in the book is my mom also was very worried that I was reading too much and I wasn't doing math and I wasn't, you know, and she even took me to my third grade teacher and she was like, I'm really worried about Isra. All she does is read. She just wants to sit in a corner and read. And my teacher, Ms. Diane was like, that's a very positive thing. You don't have to worry, but she's still learning, even though it's not math or science. And so like, there's that thing, right? You have to do something that is falls under a very small definition of productivity. So that's kind of like how I, I grew up, but I think reading as a passion for me was a byproduct of the environment I was growing up in. Saudi Arabia is very different now back at that time, there was limited things you could do uh, unless you lived on a compound, you weren't going out to play and stuff. So just the culture is very different. So it allowed me to access other worlds um, just from my room. And today you are a therapist. You're very successful as a therapist, but when you were younger, what did you see yourself becoming and what was your idea for success? When I was younger, all the way up until probably my first year of undergrad, I was actually pursuing um, marine conservation science. I, I wanted to be a marine biologist and, you know, save the whales, which is still a very strong passion of mine. I'm always up to date with what's going on in that world. Um, and so I, I genuinely felt that I was going to service the world in this way through conservation science. Um, but halfway through my undergrad, I started taking psychology courses as a part of my environmental psych requirement. And I just became so much more interested in supporting like development for human beings and kind of helping people through that, you know, part of their lives. And so that kind of became a redefined idea of what my service to the world would be. And you know, success is like a very interesting thing because when you ask people to define success, they often want to give you um, a career related, you know, um, definition or a monetary definition or even like a relationship oriented one. But I don't know if I ever thought about success in in like a concrete goal when I was younger. I just always knew that I needed to have a job where I'm impacting the world around me. Like right from the beginning, I just needed to feel like I'm giving back. And so I was always very involved in like volunteering and donations and trying to do charity things, even when I was very young. So that to me is success, by the way. But how'd your parents feel about that, the marine conservationist? I think they just, they just kind of didn't know a lot about it, truthfully. I mean, these are people who- Did they encourage it or were they like, okay, well, make sure you get a business minor (laughs) Mm -hmm. or something like that Mm -hmm. just in case. Yeah. No, you know what? It was in a a science field. um, So they Mm -hmm. were happy. You know, if I was going to go off and get a PhD in the sciences, that's that's fine. Um, So they were definitely supportive of it, even if they didn't fully understand it. Beautiful. Yeah. One more question about your childhood. What yeah. kind of student were you? Were you uh, like an A student or were you? I was predominantly an A student. Um, I struggled with a few subjects just by virtue of not being good at it and needing to try much harder. Uh, so those were the course, like predominantly math. I struggled a lot in grade 11 and grade 12 math. Um, so I did not end up with A's. But outside of that, I was definitely an A student. And you became a therapist. Um, obviously, we've all heard the word therapist, but mm-hmm. what does that mean, actually? Like, what's your what's a day in the life of Israel like as a therapist? Are you seeing patients? Are you doing research? Are you obviously you're doing a lot of writing? Yeah. So I actually pivoted my therapist career in a very interesting way about seven years ago at the intersection of healthcare and technology and like the startup world. And so a day in my life, you know, I predominantly work uh, in clinical strategy and operations for mental health tech startups. And I've worked at one before for about four and a half years or four years, I should say, and then did consulting with digital health companies while I was writing the book and currently am on a long-term consulting project with a very cool mental health startup, which is providing mental health services for Asian Americans. So it's a very culturally competent uh, 
tech-based mental health service. So for me, it was really important to be able to scale my impact without borrowing too much terminology from, you know, the tech bros, but I really did want to scale my impact on how many people I'm affecting. So I practiced as a one-on-one -on -one clinician for about five, six years, and I love the work, but I felt limited in how many people were being affected in a positive way, which is just my caseload. And I became really interested in leveraging tech in 2015. Uh, for mental health and mental health was extremely resistant to technology. It was, it's one of the last health services that caught on to using video and chat or even tracking progress, tracking analytics. Many therapists don't use tools like measurement tools for symptoms. Um, you know, like these are like assessments that your clients can do to track progress over time. They just kind of are solving problems through talk therapy, but there is a place for that. But I really wanted to change the way we offer mental health services. And so my day-to-day -day is different from a very one-on-one -on -one therapist. But you did do the one-on-one -on -one thing yes. for a little yeah. while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned in the book that you were working in digital health, that you, you said you were married. I don't know what your situation is today, but you were married. You're living in New York City. People would look at you from the outside and, and, and just assume that you were thriving, you're successful, mm -hmm. but you felt tired all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so obviously that level of productivity could affect your own mental health. So let's talk about sort of the genesis of this idea of toxic productivity in your own personal life? How, how did that sort of come about? What was the aha moment? Where were you? What was going on around you? And, and um, what did you do about it? Yeah, so I am still married. And uh, I think there were times when I was writing this book, that that anecdote still felt true, that somebody could look at me and be like, Tam, she's writing a book, and then she lives here and blah, blah, blah. And with the inside, I'm like, I am like, so frazzled all the time. So I, I was not familiar with the phrase of toxic productivity. I never saw productivity as having a harmful slant to it at all. I mean, I came up in the girl boss era, right? And so I think this idea of overworking until you're tired is a good thing, right? Like that was something that I kind of came of age in. That was the culture. And my foundation was you always have to be doing something. You can't rest. Even if you're on vacation, you have to have some productive thing come out of it from my childhood. So it was like this foundation and then like the culture on top of the girl boss era, um, like just sleep when you're dead type of thing. Um, I just, I didn't even think it was a problem. Like I didn't think the fact that I was going out seven nights a week was a problem. This was a good thing. We have to strive for this. And, you know, I was working really, we were a small startup. There was a lot of work to be done, but I think it was maybe just feeling really worn down because you might be motivated to do things. You might be motivated to change like the world around you. You might be really motivated to get stuff done, but eventually, like if you're not resting, you're not nourishing your body, you don't understand what taking breaks even means, it's eventually going to wear you down. And that starts feeling like just being really tired. And so for me, it wasn't like one aha moment. I think it was just reflecting on like why I'm tired all the time. I think that became a very big problem. Like how tired I was, was a very palpable problem in my, in my life to the point where I was starting to feel too tired to go out. So I'd be taking espresso shots at like 10 PM, right. Just to kind of make it through. And that's, that to me felt a little off from my regular. So I think for anybody who's listening, perhaps like the best way to figure out if something is wrong, even if you don't know the name for it, because I didn't know the name for it is to see if you're doing things that are off off brand for you. Is it off schedule for you to do certain things? And uh, so to me, it was like over time, I recognized that my habits were very unhealthy. 
And I was kind of like, it's my curious nature. I was like, well, why do I keep doing this stuff? Like, why do I feel bad if I'm at home? Why am I overbooking myself? And that kind of led me to learning. I was curious about human motivation. I was curious about like motivation theories. I wanted to know if there was like a word out there for this. I, I read like one of Carl Jung's books to understand like where I'm at. And I was, I was curious if this was n like normal for my developmental stage of like thirties, you know, and meaning making of life. But I stumbled upon literature that is about why, why we connect our self-worth to our productive outcomes. And so that really caught my attention and it started from there. I feel like New York is, is a uniquely um, progress oriented place as well. I used to live in New York for many years mm -hmm. and I also find that I didn't realize it at the time, but I, f I feel, I find that New York has a lot of a high proportion of, of uh, functional alcoholics. You mentioned mm -hmm. going out every night, like mm -hmm. you always go mm -hmm. out for drinks mm -hmm. and it's to take the edge off because people work so hard during the day and that's just baked into, um, that culture. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, do you find that both men and women experience productivity in the same sort of toxic way, or is it sort of, does it lean a little bit more towards one, one gender or the other gender? No, I don't think that this is delineated by gender. I don't even think it's delineated by culture or even like socioeconomic status. It really is a byproduct of how you were raised to view your value, right? And that's either your parents, your schooling, your friends around you. And some environments can definitely amplify it so much more. Um, and it's a function of like who you're around all the time. And it's just a function of how you learned to make yourself feel better. Like your original coping and feeling accepted and loved by others. Um, if that's, if you learned that if I do well, people love me. If I am helpful and useful around the house, my parents love me more than my siblings. That Those are the things that create the foundation for this relationship between self-worth and productivity. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. I remember I went to a dinner party in New York once. It was at a, it was a, a sort of mindfulness person hosted this dinner party. There were probably 20 people there. And she started the dinner party by having each of us go around and introduce ourselves. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to these people introduce themselves and everybody had like their elevator pitch of the thing that they do and what they're striving for and what kind of outcome they want. And I'm this person and I have associates in this and I, mm -hmm. I'm working on this product. And it's like, wow, man, I don't, I don't have all these Mm -hmm. Projects that I'm working on right mm -hmm. now. So I can imagine being around that, like you say, it amplifies the need to be doing more, to be yes. doing more than what maybe you think you're doing. And maybe you're, what you're doing is, you know, is satisfactory or fulfilling to you. But yeah, being around so many people. And I think that since the pandemic, that the New Yorkers dispersed, they went to Nashville, they went to Austin, they went to mm -hmm. Florida, they went all over the country. So mm -hmm. there's probably people sitting around at dinner parties all over the country right now, mm -hmm. you know, talking about all of the projects and the goals and the objections of the objectives that they have in their life, which again, makes people feel like maybe I'm not doing enough. Yeah. And you mentioned in the book about values and what we're quotes chasing should be connected to our uh, values. How does one, because again, I think this is a concept that a lot of, we, we know what a value is, but I don't know if you stopped an average person on the street, even someone who considered themselves to be productive and said, what are your top three values? If they would even be able to articulate that. Mm -hmm. How does one come up with values? 
Yeah, you know, uh, so many early readers ask me the same question. I think it's like chapter five or whatever. I think it's one of the chapters where I go into it. And I've so I've gotten this question a lot. So many people have asked me is like, how do you even know your values? Like we don't actually learn values, right? But we actually do learn values. We just don't have a name for it. And so, for example, like if I were to take my example, right? Like I can sit here and say, sure, I was raised in a home where the culture was of doing. So a really important value that I've absorbed is industriousness, doing something. You know, my parents are very charitable people. I absorb that. And that's why I'm like, okay, like I need to give back. I need to have a purpose and blah, blah, blah. So if you don't, if you don't, if you can't name your values, I would recommend two things. One, look back on the last four months of your life or three months of your life and just kind of see what the themes are in the things that you do. If you're somebody who likes to spend a lot of time with friends, right? And that's like a priority for you in your week. And it's always the same group of friends. It's not like you're going out to meet new people every weekend. You're really committed to deepening your relationship. Then social connection and community is a value for you. And that comes through in what you are dedicating your time to. So that's one way to do it is reflect on where are you dedicating your time? What are your priorities? What's important to you? Like I have some friends who regularly pick hanging out with their family, like their fam, like their biological original family over going to like a picnic with friends. Like I have friends like that. So family is an important value for them. I have some people in my life who are purely driven by getting to a specific salary number. Everything in their life is structured to get to the salary number by certain age. So, you know, ambition or finance, like financial security is a value for them. So you just have to think about where you're putting your time. What do you prioritize over the last, last three months? Another way to do it is to ask somebody who knows you really well. Uh, because people who live with us, people who are close to us, um, often have more information about us than we give them credit for. So you can ask them and say, hey, like if you had to, what do you think are the most important things for me? You've known me for 15 years. You've known me for 10 years. Like what are some things you think are important to me? And then you can give them context as to why you're asking, but you could also go the therapeutic route and like there's a worksheet, like you can fill out the reflection so you can journal and there's a guided prompt in, in the book that can help you also narrow down on your values. So you could do a lot of journaling. Um, if you do, if you do journaling for like a solid 30 day stretch where you're just journaling, whatever's coming to your mind for a 10 minute period, and then you go back and read it. You will find themes in there that speak to your values. Would you mind sharing what your top values are for yourself? Yeah, um, absolutely. So honesty is probably my most important value because uh, I feel like you can't have, all these are my opinions, by the way. So these are not scientific facts. I just want to say that. But to me, I feel like you can't have respect without honesty. You can't have love without honesty. You can't have compassion without honesty. So to me, honesty is like the foundational value. I think like being in service is a second very important value for me, whether it's through charitable stuff, fundraisers, whether it's my time, my energy, impacting the world around you in service is a big thing for me. Um, and the final thing would be is kindness because you can give feedback with kindness and it's still valuable. You can ask for change with kindness. It's still valuable. You can, uh, you can return the food at the restaurant, right? But you do it with kindness and it's still valuable. So I think that is a really important thing for me. Mm -hmm. So you have your values mm -hmm. and you are operating uh, uh, ideally in alignment with your values. But let's say somebody lives in New York, their rent is $6,000 a month. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a family, mm -hmm. the private school tuition is $40,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Um, and they just got all the things and they need to hit that number. That's a yeah. hurry number. Yeah. At what point does productivity become, quotes, toxic? When it's the only thing that you're putting your energy towards. So understanding that life circumstances exist, I fully recognize that not everybody has the privilege of taking vacation and resting. You know, people have multiple kids. You're taking care of elder parents. There's a million things happening that a lot that kind of prevent you from doing certain things. So my my approach to this stuff is borrowed from 
substance use treatment. So harm reduction in substance use is not removing the substance use altogether, but trying to find safer ways of doing it. Another important aspect of harm reduction is adding healthier alternatives instead of focusing on taking things out because that can be very hard. So the more good practices you add, the more balanced your life becomes. So if you have to pursue that number and you have to be, you know, working on weekends because you need to pay the bills because your kids have to go to a good school, that is a very important thing in life. So think about how can I infuse some positive healthier habits, even in the small slivers of time that I have available. So if you are back to back meetings all day, you get on the subway, maybe do a meditation in your ear. If, if it feels right, New York city subway is a wild place. So maybe not there, but maybe on your walk to the train, do a meditation instead, or do a two minute meditation before you go to sleep. And in those ways, add these pockets of rest or pockets of healthy productivity. You know, maybe really thinking about your sleep hygiene. That's something we do have control over. And that becomes a really healthy practice that gives you resilience, both physical and emotional. And so it's not about just revamping your life and, you know, living like the prairie life of just being very slow and, you know, intentional. We can't do that because we live in a society that does not value it at all. So we have to find our way of infusing it in our life. And that's how I do it. People often assume that I'm very like calm and like I do have no toxic productivity habits, but I do. I mean, I still struggle with it, even though I have like a whole book on it. Right. So my thing is always aim to insert some good habits in your routine and aim for 80 percent of the time to be good at it. So leave some room for error. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the things that I find um, annoying, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. since you love honesty, mm -hmm. I find annoying is when people hear a phrase like toxic pot productivity and they make the conclusion that, oh, she's saying I shouldn't be productive at all. And it's like, no, that's not what she's saying. And mm -hmm. she's not even saying she's perfect at it. She's, she's working towards something and she's offering us principles that we could use whichever ones we find useful to work towards as, as well. And mm -hmm. it's all a matter of degrees. It's not about black, white. And you actually mentioned this later on in the book about the differences in mm -hmm. how we tend to see things, which could be toxic is seeing things as black, white, mm -hmm. jumping to conclusions, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you also talked about this one anecdote with, you called him Jeremy. I'm sure that wasn't his real name, but the dating example and you yeah. speeding up by slowing down. And I think it really um, illustrates this point you're making well. Would you mind going into a little bit more detail around that? Of that, story? that principle or the story itself? St Jeremy, who wanted to yeah. date. Yeah, yes. Know? I very intentionally put that in there because people think that productivity or the productivity mindset only applies to work and personal development, but it actually, the way we are in our culture right now, it has permeated through every single arena of our life. Parents struggle with it. People in romantic relations struggle with it. Friendships struggle with this because things need to be a certain way for us to be friends and for me to be accepted by my friends. So that's why I very intentionally put that um, case vignette, if you will, in there. So the whole, the story is about this man who believes that he needs to be in a relationship by X time because that was his plan for life. And his other friends are all partnered. So that's activating some social comparison in him. And so he just creates dating to be a milestone with a metric of success related to it. And that meant for him X amount of dates per week means like a certain percentage will follow through to the next, a certain percentage. And so he was like really trying to control it in a very, very mathematical, statistical way. Um, and was just like speeding through it, uh, going on dates with people that he didn't even connect with because not going on dates made him feel that he wasn't doing anything to change his situation. And uh -huh. the, the it's story. Understandable. I, I get yeah. that. I just knew more. Of course. Right. Like it's a numbers game. You hear that. You hear people say that all the time. And, but it becomes very draining, um, not just emotionally, but also, you know, financially and time wise, 
if you don't understand what you're chasing and why. And so if you don't have clarity on your why, like, why do I want to date? Why am I going on a date with this specific person? You know, then you're, then you're wasting your energy and that eventually catches up because what ends up happening as it did with Jeremy, that just became the, the, the most important focus in his life. So friendship started becoming deprioritized. He was just kind of like, working the room at events and that kind of started giving him a little bit of a negative reputation because he also was not paying attention to the person in front of him because he has a checklist and you know you're just trying to go through it and and so i think that is a very very toxic productivity mindset yardstick to measure metrics of success checklist oriented no understanding of why i even like these things and so my work with him was really around how do we get you to connect with yourself? Who told you you have to have a relationship at X time of your life? And what is it about a relationship you think will benefit your life right now? Who are you going to be as a partner? These are things that people who are so focused on the outcome, they are not thinking about any of these things. They're not thinking about why it's important. They're not thinking about like, what am I even going to do in that situation? Right? So, um, and so to, you know, to slow down, to speed up is if you take some time away from this metric driven thing and focus on understanding your why, what your intention is, what are you hoping this will bring you and where is it really coming from? If you spend some front end investment time, which feels slow, you are more likely to find a partner who is more aligned to you because you have so much more understanding of yourself. So it shortens that time a little bit of the search, if you will. Yeah, and I really like the way you described the the exchange between you and, and Jeremy because you weren't pointing out these connections initially. You were wanting to ask him questions and he was getting frustrated with you because to him, it seemed like you were asking him these obvious kind of silly questions mm -hmm. in contrast to his personal goals. And I feel like your book does that as well. You present us with a lot of tools and resources for sort of making that connection with ourselves in, in terms of our own relationship with productivity, because there's so many misconceptions around this concept of productivity and, and what we should and shouldn't be striving for. And you talk about some of those misconceptions as being things like everything matters equally and multitasking is the shortcut to mm -hmm. avoiding toxic productivity and working mm -hmm. longer is, you know, useful from time to time and waking up earlier helps. But you say there's something about all of those that if we're not careful, we could find ourselves slipping into this sort of toxic uh, area of productivity. Can you say mm -hmm. a little more about that? Absolutely. So there are certain principles that we as a culture and society at large have just accepted as the way things are. So the best example is I have heard this phrase, like since I was a child, like the early bird gets the worm, right? So it's all about being early, early. And every, our school starts early. Everyone's like, get to work early and everything needs to start early. And everyone is waking up at five o'clock. Right. And, and so, but while that there is a lot of merit to that, if your life does not respond well to that, then that's not helpful for you. So if you're not somebody who works their best at 5 a.m., maybe a 5 a.m. workout is not for you. Maybe a 4 p.m. workout is for you, right? If you are not somebody who can do things very early in the morning and be creatively active, then maybe you should write in the afternoon or do all of your creative writing work in the afternoon, whatever your job is, right? Whatever requires creative thinking, push it down, just kind of working with yourself. So a lot of these myths are these blanket statements that can provide success if you apply them, but they're not always applicable to everybody at all points of their life. And it's very important for us to think about what is working for us in our life and in our body, instead of just doing what everybody else is doing. And I think for me, I did, I, I shared this in the book too. I did the whole like wake up early and journal and meditate and like all of that. Right. But at, at some point it just became like a slog. Like I was just like, like I wasn't present and I, it was just one more thing I had to do. So it was not helpful for me. 
What is helpful for me in the morning is having my coffee and breakfast while watching the great British baking show. And so I do that for 10 minutes every morning instead of doing a journal exercise and a meditation because it wasn't making me feel good. I journal and meditate afterwards at different points of the day. And so I think that's the thing. You have to figure out what works for you instead of these myths that multitasking is going to help me finish more things. The truth is multitasking makes you start more things. You have many tasks running parallel, but you don't necessarily finish them all. Is it unhelpful to think that I should be journaling and meditating even though I'm not? And I should be making more time for myself even though I'm not? Mm. I mean, because you talk about the word toxic and I'm not sure. Is it a synonym for unhealthy or unhelpful or all of the above? Like, well, how should we relate to these these? these activities that everybody's talking about that maybe we don't do, right? Yeah. Because we just don't, we're not interested, but mm -hmm. in the back of our mind, deep down in those little crevices that we don't want to admit to ourselves, we may be thinking to ourselves, well, I should be meditating, mm -hmm. should be journaling, I should be walking more, I should be doing this, I should be doing that, but I don't want to be toxic. Yeah, yeah, want, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand know, how that. How do you navigate that? So toxic to me is when something that is meant to be good becomes bad. So it's not in its natural state, it's not harmful. But if you bad meaning bad meaning what though? Like unhelpful. Okay. It becomes detrimental to your health. Mm -hmm. And so like a you know, an example I often use is you can die from water poisoning. If you drink too much water too fast, it happens at festivals all the time. People get water poisoning because they just chuck too much water for whatever reason. But um so that's the thing. Toxic to me is habits that are meant to be good, but if you overdo it or you do it with the wrong intention, they become harmful or detrimental to your health. So the thing to answer your question is anytime there is a should, I always ask people to pause and reflect on what the intention is behind that. And what are you really shying away from? So to give a very concrete example, if you're thinking, hmm, I should journal, I would say, why do you think you should journal? What are you hoping to get out of journaling? And maybe then we find another way to, for you to get that same outcome without journaling, because clearly you don't want to journal. So journaling is going to be like a not fun exercise for you. It might not even be helpful because your heart's not in it. So it's about like, what are you looking for? It, oh, I should go to the gym every day. Okay, but why? Are you looking to increase your health, like your cardio? Okay, can you do a walk instead? Can you get a walking pad at home instead if you work from home? How can we get you that outcome without you having to follow the same yardstick that everybody else is doing? That's when we split from our values. So that's what I mean by living like a value aligned life is if you're doing something just because somebody else is doing it and you're feeling this like negative pressure that you have to do it because other people are doing it and you also are mean to yourself because you're not doing it, those three things come together and they create this very toxic environment. Now, if you're trying to encourage yourself to walk more because it is healthy and you're like, oh, I should walk, then Perhaps like your intention is coming from inside of you. Maybe your doctor is like me. Hey, you should walk a little bit more. And so that's different. But if you're being mean to yourself, if you're putting yourself down, if you feel like I'm not good enough because I don't go to this like yoga studio like this other person does, right? That becomes unhelpful and toxic. Yeah, you talk about the inner critic. Is that what you're referring to here yeah. with being mean to yourself? Yeah. So what do you think about like David Goggins and that whole, you know, very sort of, um, um, aggressive self-talk, like get mm. your ass out and go for the run and mm. stop being a bitch and da -da 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 -da. Yeah. is that toxic But in, in, in the context of your, your, your work here? So I can not... be motivating for some people, <laughs> sure. right? Sure. Yeah. I'm not familiar with this, the person that you just named. Um, but I have seen stuff like that for sure. And I have some friends who respond very well to it. And this is just my experience. Like literally, this is just my experience. All of the people I know who respond well to this type of motivational content are straight men. 
Yeah. I have never like had. Real star during, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know the research on this, but this is literally just my world. Literally, you know, I'm thinking of four guys right now. I don't have any female friends, straight or not, who respond well to this type of stuff. And so maybe there is something there, right? Maybe there is something with these two cultures um, across the gender divide. But for me, I think that from a therapeutic, like psychology perspective, you can berate someone and you can shame them and you will get a behavior change, but it will not be a sustainable behavior change. So you can definitely get people's ass moving and tell them to stop being a bitch about stuff and just eat the kale, but it's not going to be a sustainable long-term change. So for me, it's all about how can I make this change so that lasts me a long time and I don't lose like steam after six months after someone has stopped yelling at me. Yeah. That's what I was referring to earlier when I was asking you, do men and women relate to this mm. in a different way? Because mm. I know as a man, as a straight male, I yeah. also, you know, I, I'm intrigued when someone's speaking to me like a drill sergeant. It's not mm -hmm. something I necessarily want in my mm -hmm. life because I'm pretty disciplined myself, but I know that if I'm messing around, and procrastinating, mm -hmm. you know, hearing those kinds of messages, it's almost like, I don't know, it's weird. With men, you can sort of compartmentalize it and not necessarily take it personally mm -hmm. because there is a feeling of fulfillment that comes from achieving the goal that you've been procrastinating on. I don't know if it's the same with women. Maybe with women, it's more about how you feel in the process. I don't know. I'm just mm -hmm. I'm not a therapist, completely mm -hmm. speculating, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, I think it's interesting because it could be a bit of a hybrid understanding of, yes, this is toxic and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I'm so happy I finished the marathon or the, yeah. you know, I stopped being a bitch at mile, you know, mm -hmm. 23 and I just, I got on with it. And mm -hmm. and that feeling of completion um, is something that overrides whatever I had to say to myself or whatever, whatever yeah. motivational content I listened to in the process. Yeah, so this is a very interesting point. A friend and a friend and I often debate this topic um, because his social media for you page is just filled with this type of stuff, and mine is like a different way of the same message, right? It's I guess you could say yeah, it's a little more nurturing. Um, so I don't know the research on this at all, so I can't speak to that. But I will say one thing um, is that I wonder if there are like, can you access resilience? and motivation at mile 23 without being berated, right? Like I would ask that question and I would ask what that means for somebody, not to pathologize it because you also don't want to be too soft and nurturing and not hold people accountable, right? You don't want to be that person who's like, oh, you know, your body's not feeling it. That's okay. You don't have to work out for two weeks. Like, no, you have to exercise for your health. And so there is this distinction that I draw between self-care and self-sabotage. And sometimes we can merge those two things um, with by, by, by being too soft, perhaps. But to me, again, like, and I talk about this with one of my case vignettes in the book, is shame is a very powerful motivator. And when we make somebody feel bad about themselves, like they're not as good as the other guy who was at mile 25 already, right? And saying all of these things, the very drill sergeant style um, you know, language, it's a very powerful motivator and it will get you to the finish line, but you're not going to be able to maintain it. And in, in, if you need, and I'm not talking about you and I'm not talking about men in general, I think this is the case vignette from the story as a, as a woman, as a female client, uh, because she was like this. And so if you need to access shame to constantly motivate yourself to finish and be productive and finish what you started, then you're not going to be in a healthy place for a long time because shame is very corrosive. It really erodes how good you feel about yourself. And the, the less good or the worse, I say, the worse you feel about yourself, the, the more you take on to do more to prove yourself. And then you shame yourself to finish all these things that you took on and then you're not able to finish. And so shame makes you feel bad. Then you feel bad about yourself and then you start the whole cycle again. So shame is a very corrosive emotion. And I think if you're in a sprint season of your life, I, that I'm, again, it's not black and white, right? If you're in a sprint season of your life and you just have to get this done, like I had to submit this manuscript at a certain time. 
So yeah, I had to push through it. I had to be like, I don't have time to rest right now. I have to work till two o'clock in the morning. But that just can't be the way you live your life forever. That should be your exception. Right. Because mm -hmm. I have no idea what your process was like writing this book, but I'm sure you had moments where you had to get, a, you had to meet a deadline and you had to stay up a little later than you wanted to or wake mm -hmm. up a little earlier than you wanted to and push mm -hmm. yourself and, you know, use all kinds of mental gymnastics mm -hmm. to get it to. At yeah. least that's been my experience with, with Absolutely. writing books. So that must have been very sort of, you got a chance to put into practice mm -hmm. a lot of the things that you were, you were writing about as yes. you were writing the book. Yeah. I actually shared in the book, there are some parts of the book that are just kind of like me literally talking about the writing process and how some stuff comes up for me. Uh, certain like relevant chapters, for sure, I bring it up because we're all human and we're all going to struggle with it. And I think it's just about identifying your patterns. I think that's the most important thing. We might not be able to change a pattern forever. Like I know I'm always going to want to say yes to things that come my way because I'm always very op like optimistic about opportunities. But, you know, I have to change my pattern. I have to say, okay, maybe get in the habit of reflecting on your whole calendar before so you say yes to something. And just like these small little tweaks. Or even maybe taking a break. You talked about that newsletter yeah. that you wrote four years ago and you, you start to feel like a job. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you decided to leave it for a year and then come back to it. Mm -hmm. So what was, that, what was that process like? And is that something that you, I mean, you mentioned it in your book, so maybe you, you're inadvertently recommending it, but is that something you, you recommend for people or in just certain situations? Do you have a, sort of an ongoing, indefinite process where you're creating something and it starts to feel a job? Yeah. I mean, my, my personal recommendation is to reflect on what that is bringing you. And that's, that's how I realized that I didn't need to do that newsletter anymore. It was a thing on my to-do list and I never questioned why it remained there. I felt the pressure of continually, continually producing content on this newsletter. Um, and meaningful content, right? Not stuff that I'm just like pulling together. Um, and that requires time. And then I started thinking about, okay, here are the other things you're doing in your life. Like, what is this newsletter serving you right now? Because it was serving something very different when it started. And that, that questioning did allow me to say, maybe for now, I'm going to pause this and I will come back to it when my life demands this again, which it did. And I knew that it would because I knew the book was coming out. I was writing the book and all that stuff, right? And so, yes, I would recommend that, you know, question the things that you're ongoingly doing. If you're feeling like it's a job because you've taken on too many other things, question those things as well. Like, do I really need to be part of this, like, committee in my neighborhood that takes up, like, four hours a month? If you don't need to be a part of that, then maybe pull back on that. It'll free up some time for your creative endeavor. Yeah. And I think it ties back to what we talked about earlier, which is identifying your values. Yeah. And, Cause I, I have a newsletter. I've been, it's a daily newsletter I've been sending out every day for about eight years. And My I goodness. pretty much live in that. This is a job space, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it ties back to one of my major values mm -hmm. um, in life, which is, which is creating inspirational content, helping people find their purpose. This is what mm -hmm. this podcast is about. And while it does feel like a job, uh, most times um, it also gives me an opportunity to organize my thoughts about things. And most of my books are the byproduct of this daily mm -hmm. messages that I'm sending out. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of direct positive uh, byproducts of this. And, and again, I, I don't think it's, we shouldn't look at any of this as either it's all like a job or mm -hmm. it's all for fun. Like mm -hmm. it's, as long as it, my point is it can feel a bit like a job, but it can also be a part of your purpose or it can also be a part of your mission. And, um, and interestingly, very recently I, I had a download of a way that I want to sort of evolve that mission to something else, which may not be that, but, but that's in my experience, that's kind of how those changes happen is it's more like an evolution around, okay, this is a better way to, to, to access your mission at, for this season of your life. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'll just usually stick with things until that, that download comes, mm -hmm. but it's not about 
you know, it's too hard. I don't want to do it anymore. It's more about, I want to now do it this way. This feels more aligned with how I want to operate. Exactly. And, you know, things can be a job and it doesn't mean that you have to, that has to be like misery. A lot of people love their jobs and there are parts of your job that you absolutely adore doing. Right. So to me, it's less about like, this is a job and I, it's too hard and I don't want to do it, but it's really just asking yourself, why am I doing it? And you're doing it because it brings you connection to your mission. It furthers your business and your, you know, the value that you bring to the world. And that's important to you. And so that's the point of like reflecting. I think one of my biggest hope that people take away from this book is, are we being intentional with where we are putting our time? And, you know, and so that really changes our relationship to productivity. If you know why you're doing something and you know it and you feel connected to it, then you can push through the hard moments of like a menial task or it's boring or it's repetitive or I have to do it. Right. It's just really about finding that that seed of how it's connected to your intention. Yeah, I had a note about that. And just above that, it said productivity versus busy. Let's talk a little bit about that then, since you brought up intentionality. Um, we live in like a busy culture. Busy is a badge of honor. And if you're super busy, then you're valued and you're valuable. If your calendar is not like double backed, then like nobody loves you. Um, so I think that there's a reason busy work is called busy work. Because it's not connected to anything. You just have to kind of do these little things. And it's even a greeting, right? How are you doing? Oh, you know, busy. Yes. It's like, like, it's no like, one ever what? questions it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm so embarrassed to say this. I literally said this yesterday at a birthday picnic. I met somebody after a full year. We met at the last birthday picnic. And he was like, oh my gosh, Israel, how have you been? And I was like, oh, you just have been busy. And then I was like, ew, like, why did I say that? That gives him no context in my life. Um, but yeah, it's like an easy thing to say, right? And you, people can make whatever they want from it. And and then you kind of just move on, right? There's like a, a, commiserate, a commiserating moment. It's like, oh yeah, I'm busy too. And then you just nod. But... <laughs> I just described my, my, uh, what happened yesterday. Um, but, but if you're not busy, you feel a little shame around, oh gosh, they're busy. They're probably doing something amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm not really they're busy. Yeah. Or, but like, I think about the Europeans a lot. Like they are not busy in the summer. Like the, even stores are closed. Like August, you can't even go to a pharmacy on a Sunday in France. Like it's wild. I'm like, we have this culture of urgency and that does tie to busyness as well. Um, but productive, like true productivity in my view is bringing you closer to your values, your purpose, your mission, like whatever you want to call it, but it is part of something that you are building. Busy is doing things for the sake of doing them. So coming back to Jeremy's example, he was mindlessly going on dates went on multiple dates with people he didn't even like. Like he knew that going in, right? That this was not going to be a good fit, but he was like, uh, let, let's just see what happens, right? Let, let's just see what happens. What's the worst case? It's one dinner. And that's just busy. He's just filling up his calendar with stuff because being at home and not dating was too anxiety provoking. So productive is when you are really doing something that brings you joy and flow and connection and purpose. Busy is just doing things for the sake of doing them. And I think a lot of us have that. And I don't, I don't necessarily think obligations fall under busy, like whether it's like an obligation to your child or your neighbor or your parent or whatever. I think those are things are, those are our responsibilities in our relationships. Um, but taking stock of, again, where you're spending your time is really important to me. I learned that I was doing a lot of stuff that was, I was just kind of like a rolling stone, no moss being gathered, just kind of doing things for the sake of doing them. And, and I really had to stop. And now I'm so much more intentional about the things I say yes to, because I always ask myself, like, is this going to bring me closer to whatever X, Y, Z goal that I have? So Isra, when I read this section on self-care, I was like, oh my God, shots fired. Self-care <laughs> toxic? It can be toxic? What do, you, what do you mean by that? Oh my gosh. I could literally give a TED talk on this. That's but... when we're supposed to be <laughs> taking the edge off, right? 
Mm -hmm. But what's happened is in the same way that productivity like frameworks have entered our romantic arena, they have also entered our self-care arena. And now self-care has to look a very specific way. You have to wear certain things to do them. You have to have access to money to do them. Right. And if you're not going to this infrared sauna, then you are not caring for yourself. Right. And so that's the thing. It's we have commodified self-care, we have commercialized it, and we have made it an outcome to achieve where the goal of self-care is in being. We are being in the moment. We are being in the present. We are being with our body. We are being with our connections. We are being with joy. But what we've done is we've made it an achievement marker. And so now you have to have the cute matching separate to go to aloe studio with your cute yoga bag and go to the infrared sauna and go to rumble boxing or right like it's just this thing that has become so commercialized and of course the moment you put an achievement marker onto anything productivity framework will settle in very easily because the foundation of the productivity framework is are you ashamed for not doing this thing do you feel guilty for not doing this thing um, other people are doing this thing. You're the only one who's not doing it. And therefore you are not good enough. You are bad. And so that just immediately charges us to do things that, um, even though they're self-care activities are not actually giving you the benefit of self-care. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's, I think it's a little bit of, uh, the fish in the water, like they, they can't see the water type of thing happening mm -hmm. in our culture because it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's the weekend. Oh my God, I need to be doing something for this this weekend. It's a holiday. What, what, what are we getting so-and-so for Christmas? Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. vacation. Are we going to go somewhere? Gonna, can we just stay around? No, we need to go somewhere because this is when we have one vacation. Yes. You know, it's like, it's it's everywhere. It's yeah. everywhere. Even in those yeah. moments when we're supposed to be maybe relaxing or taking a break, it's it's there's all this pressure to do something. We need to make a memory. We need to, mm -hmm. you know go somewhere mm -hmm. and, and have that experience. And that mm -hmm. in and of itself could put a lot, especially if you're with someone who is having to finance all this, <laughs> they're thinking in their mind, okay, well, I need to work around the clock so that I can keep my family, my wife, my kids, my husband, my kids, whatever, happy. Mm -hmm. And um, so maybe one person is getting the benefit of, mm -hmm. of this sort of slow living you're talking about, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the other person who's having to, to, to finance it all mm -hmm. is having to make the, the sacrifice. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, and I think the this productivity mindset of achievement orientation to be good enough has definitely seeped into our families as well. I, I think people, I mean, the Christmas card culture has become absolutely you know, it used to be like a quaint thing you did by the mantelpiece, but now people are doing these themed things, right? Like, and again, it's all about, am I good enough as the rest of my peers? And, and there's like other cultural components to this as well, for sure, um, that contribute to this. But I think this idea, we can latch on to any external thing, any external marker, if we inherently don't feel good enough. So whether it's your academics, whether it's your vacation, whether it's your Christmas card, right? I think that we, if we are in, inherently seeking external validation, which I talk, which I mentioned is like one of the roots of this, we're always going to get trapped in this mindset because we're gonna want more because we need to feel good about ourselves. And so to me, productivity culture, the the antidote to unhealthy productivity is emotional regulation, is learning to feel good about yourself. It's navigating difficult emotions like guilt and shame so that you don't react with productivity. You have a healthier response to productivity. And these are all like, you know, vague terms that therapists use, but it is, it is, it is tangible. You can break it down and make it a reality. And at the same time, when you're in a couple type of dynamic, mm -hmm. you know, one person could have a different idea of what a vacation is supposed to be. You know, yes. we need to get up at six in the morning, go to the mm. first tourist attraction. I have the whole day planned. The other person just wants to sleep in and, mm -hmm. and take it easy. And that's their mm -hmm. idea of, of slowing down and things yeah. like that. So, so how do you, how do you sort of, uh, get on the same page with your partner? What are some tips for, for that when it comes to slowing down, when it comes to, um, to, to 
I guess, the anecdote to, to toxic productivity. Yeah. Even, so, it doesn't have to be on vacation. It could just be in regular life too. Yeah. Um, I think that in, when two people are coming from such a different mindset, it's really important that we understand what that gives them. And so having like a, if you've noticed that this is now a point of friction in your relationship, right, then you need to sit down and be like, okay, like, what does this mean for you? What do you get out of doing X, Y, Z thing? Like, and then both people will have meaning to it. It means something for both people. And then if you can understand what the meaning is, usually you will, you will be able to find one thing that overlaps in that meaning. And you can use that as a bridge and find a way to meet in the middle for that. So, you know, what's a good if, question. What's a good lead in question for that conversation? For the, what does this the mean, mean for you? What's the, well, yeah. What does this mean for you? Cause okay. you, you say that to somebody, they could take it the wrong way. And yeah. it's like, mm -hmm. so a couple of ways you can ask this and I'll use the vacation example. Cause it's a really good one. Um, yeah, I've had some, horrible arguments on vacation. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and it's really important to like respect people's different styles. Right. And so you have to like expand what it means to take a vacation together. So. How can we get this conversation started? And mind you, like, I'm not a couples therapist. So I just want to say that these are just my therapeutic opinions um, is you can present. This is what I've noticed about myself. These are the things I like. This is what I've noticed about you. These are the things you like. When you wake up early on a vacation, what is motivating you to do that? Why is that so important? Help me understand so that I can find a bridge. You have to be like, hey, I want to understand this because the motivation is to understand it. And so you understand that from their perspective, you share your perspective. And then I think it's always, it's always a good idea to come to the table with a solution. That's like my personal philosophy too. If I, something is annoying me, like I'll never just go to somebody with a problem only. Like I want to bring what well, you don't have to accept it, but I've done the work, right? And you know, I'm committed to this because I thought of a solution and a really good middle ground for somebody like that is all right, I'm going to do all of my solo stuff in the morning and then you can sleep in until like 10 30 or 11, whatever. And that way you can get that out of the way. But we have these two things that require a sunrise hike. Those are the two days you are going to wake up early, right? So like you kind of find this like balance where everyone's needs are being met while recognizing that all of your needs are not going to be met. That's unrealistic for anyone. I love that. So there's a bit of a trade-off and I, I'm not a therapist either, but I would add, yeah, you want to have that conversation at the, in the beginning, don't wait until you get into the argument to try. Oh to yeah. Oh, but you have this before you go on vacation. I would say the best conflict resolution happens in peacetime. When you are in conflict, no one is going to remember the formula. No one's going to be like, I feel blah, blah, blah. When you, right. We don't, that's not how humans work. So you have to have it in practice early and a, a difference in this kind of thing is usually a difference in a lot of other lifestyle choices. So it's good to just kind of come up with like, Hey, what does this mean for you? What are you getting out of it? What, why is this so important for you? And sometimes you think your partner understands you completely, but they don't. Hey, really quickly. If you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way, I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Okay. So I have a personal question for you. You don't have to sure. answer it if you don't want, but okay. you're a therapist. Yeah. That doesn't mean you're perfect, right? Yes. So let's say you forgot to have the conversation. Now you're on the vacation. The mm -hmm. fight breaks out. Mm -hmm. How can you sort of recover? How can you recover and get back to that same page understanding of, hey, I want to validate this person's experience. I want to have my experience validated. What are some of the, the, the tools or resources for that? Yeah. So you have to reset the fight. You have to take a break from the fight. You cannot solve the fight in the fight. In the problem. You can't do it. You have to- So what do you, you do? What do you say? I'll just, let's take a break. Yeah. Right you have to pause it. And so, so pausing a fight can be very triggering for a certain kind of person. And, and so you have to pause it, but you have to explain the pause. Hey, I'm not ignoring you. I'm not going to abandon you. I need some time to breathe. I need to figure this stuff out. I need to calm down. Like, I don't want to yell at you anymore. 
and I need some air. Like you can use anything, but you have to ask for the pause, but, but also confirm to your partner that you're not going to leave in a huff and never come back because that is a fear for a lot of people. Um, right. Especially if you have like an anxious attachment style, or if you had very volatile parents, a pause in a fight can be like earth shattering. It's scary. And so you have to explain, Hey, like, this is why I need the, the pause. And when someone is telling you they need a pause, listen to that, respect that. Cause if they have an avoidant attachment, they need to get out of the fight. Otherwise things can escalate immensely. So if someone is saying, Hey, I need a pause. Let's take half an hour. I would say reset the fight, write down what's important to you. Always read it again, cross out all the judgy mean words, and then read it out to that person. Um, I always double write. I always double write. I'll write something and then I'll go back and be like, okay, removing all of this fluff. And then I'll just read it out or send it as an email. Um, and then you come back and have a discussion. I've, I've had, again, many fights in mm -hmm. my, in my days. And mm -hmm. one of the, re one of the, um, the phrases that has worked well for me, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily solve it, but it, it can kind of help to deescalate the tension around it is the admission that, and I'm saying admission, not omission, the admission that, Hey, we're having different experiences right now. Mm. Right. So it's not mm. saying my experience is better than your experience or your mm -hmm. experience is invalid. Just the acknowledgement we're having different experiences right now. I'm feeling a little triggered, mm. which is a hard thing to say, mm -hmm. to admit that you're triggered because nobody really likes to admit that. Mm -hmm. And that I need, I need some time away. I need to take a little break. Let's mm -hmm. take a break. Mm -hmm. But then you said something in an interview, I think, where you said it's, an, and this is something I haven't been that, that good at, which is you need to schedule a time to return to the conversation because it still needs to be resolved. And yeah. I found that very helpful. Yeah. I think that's really important because it speaks to the intention that you care about this issue. A lot of times we leave things unresolved because we don't want to return to the fight. So we're like, oh, if I bring this up again, we're just going to get into the same fight. But then what happens is that issue just grows. So you have to return to, you have to, you have to say, okay, we'll talk about this in half an hour. We'll talk about this tomorrow or whatever. That also gives the other person insight into how you're thinking about this, that you're not just going to forget it or ignore it. And it also or leave, is, not come back. Exactly. And also it's an accountability for you to also think about it. For you to actually spend the time and be like, how are we going to resolve this, right? And resolution doesn't always mean getting what you want, unfortunately. Um, the second thing I'll say is the pause has to be active. You can't go pause and then watch a movie and not think about the issue, right? You can do things to center yourself and ground yourself, but you have to reflect on the issue at hand. How are we going to resolve this vacation problem? What can I do? What's important for me right now? You know, what are some things I really want to do? Why I why do I need to sleep in? Make a case for yourself. Like relationships are just negotiations. Here's the thing, though. I'm sure mm -hmm. you can relate to this. Yeah. When you're in one of those heated sort of pause situations, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you were successful in, in, in communicating the need for a pause. Usually nobody is thinking, well, I'm the problem. Usually people are thinking they're the problem. Yeah. And so when you come back together, what's, what's, I know you're not a couples therapist, but just even individually, how can you get to that place within yourself where you're able to reflect and, and on, on things that you could potentially do better or understandings that you could potentially be open to that would help to ease the tension, bring people back together and help the couple have a successful negotiation. Yeah. So two things I'll say to this. One is we have to understand how to repair our conflicts. That's really important. Repair is not resolution. Resolution is finding a solution to the problem. Repair is mending our bond. And so there's multiple ways of repair that you can do, like either through like physical touch, watching something, shared memory, like all that Building stuff, right? a sandcastle together. <laughs> building a sandcastle together. Um, and so I think like repair is really important. So always having that top of mind before you go back after the pause. And what's helped me in the past is I, I am so dependent on the notes app. Like, I don't even know what would happen if I didn't have it. 
Um, but I have a note in my notes app that has like these reminders for me um, after these type of moments with either my partner or anybody. And one of the questions there is, what am I genuinely bringing to the table? Like that's the question in there. So my practice is, and this is after many years of like growing up, um, is if I've gotten into something with someone and the whole thing happened and now we took a break and now we're pausing, like my practice is to pull up that note and just kind of go through the questions to see which one feels applicable. But as I'm going through the questions, that question is coming up for me. What am I bringing to the table? Maybe it's something as simple as I'm the one who raised my voice first. There, the explosion then occurred. It escalated, right? Maybe I am right in asking what I'm right for, but I did the raising of voice first. Like So that, I brought that. So even if I can come back and be like, hey, I shouldn't have done that, right? Immediately will dispel the tension, but both people have to participate in this. One thing you talked about in the book that I found um, was so cool because it's something that mm -hmm. is just so easy to forget is that sandcastle lesson. I'd love for you to share that with us and the idea of doing a long, big puzzle. Like what, what do those things bring to a relationship when it comes to just rooting yourself back into the present moment so mm -hmm. that you can potentially strengthen that connection? Yeah, so the sandcastle lesson is from my personal story that I share where I can be the kind of person who needs to get a lot out of their vacation, right? And I'm just like, we got to do, do, do. Everything needs to be perfect. And even if the, in the story, I talk about this day at the beach where I'm like, even the beach location, literally of where we are sitting and the proximity to other people, shade versus tree versus waves. Like it was all such a calculation in my head because I have Is this it for thing. Instagram for the picture or just, you just no, need I just need it, thing. which somehow makes it even worse. Cause like, I'm not even like, I'm not a big poster of my personal life. And so it's like, why am I doing it? Like, what is this bringing me? What it's bringing me is I have an idea of what the perfect day looks like on the beach. Like I have an idea of what a relaxed vacation looks like on the beach for me. And so I haven't questioned it. Right. So I'm like, my husband and I are at this beach and he's just chilling. And I'm like, how can this man just chill? Like he has no cares here. I am like, I should be writing a little bit more. Are we sitting at the right place? And eventually what that does is it takes you away from the moment that you are in, right? It, it takes you away from the value that you can get out of being in this place. And so eventually we ended up just making sandcastles for no reason. And it was so incredibly, it's like one of our most favorite memories. Um, and it was incredibly peaceful and relaxing. And I actually walked away feeling so full you know, and that kind of like fullness doesn't come if I had forced myself to write a chapter or, you know, if I had forced myself to get the right photo or something like that. And because there is a lot of power in just being present, like being in the moment that you are in, because anxiety takes you to the future, you know, feeling sad takes you to the past. And can your mind and body ever be at the same place? And when we engage in things that don't have a concrete finite purpose, our mind and body are in the same place. So whether it's making a sandcastle or a long puzzle, what is the purpose of a puzzle? You break it. Like you are building something. You are putting hours and time and cognitive energy into something you do have to break and put back in the box because not everybody has a giant dining table where a puzzle can stay forever, right? And you can't keep framing every puzzle. So that is, to me, is the most beautiful thing about doing puzzles. And I, uh, I do them quite often now. I recently started doing it for this reason, because it helped me be present. I was slightly challenged intellectually, so I'm like, you know, engaged. And it gives me time to process just my back of mind is doing processing. Same thing with the sandcastle. All the stuff I was so stressed about, I was able to push back and my mind was just processing my emotions in the background. And I think doing things that are very present helps you actually do the thing that your mind is designed to do. We are supposed to have a lot of unconscious processing happening. When we're trying to control every outcome, every variable, optimize for everything, be as efficient, 
we're trying to take the mind away from doing that by pushing everything into the current processing moment of now. And so it was just like a really good learning experience for me. I think I really needed that lesson. Yeah, it sounds like in curbing your tendency to to towards toxic positive to productivity um, requires a fair degree of self awareness. Yeah, and you know, even like you going your notes app saying what initiated this this argument? Oh, I raised my mm-hmm. voice, or mm-hmm. oh, I you know overlook their experience, whatever. Mm-hmm. What are some ways to increase your self-awareness that mm-hmm. you recommend to your your patients or the people who, who read your work? Yeah, I think the two really low-hanging fruit, like easy ways to access self-awareness is first, try to spend time on your own if you mm-hmm. can. Uh, no it doesn't phone, have to be no social media, no, none of that, right? No, no podcast, podcast, no <laughs> anything. We said that at the same time. <laughs> Um, yeah, like really try to engage with yourself on your own because your thoughts like eventually will come up and you'll start to learn a few things. Maybe you're in a really good mood and you reflect on the fight and you're able to sit back and be objective about yourself. And mm-hmm. the more time you spend with yourself, the more you get to know yourself. So I think in like contemporary pop culture, it's called dating yourself. Um, mm-hmm. But that implies that you're single. And I think this is applicable to everybody at any point in their life, Um, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, whether you're single or partnered, it doesn't matter. Spend some time with yourself. Um, If your life is very busy, I think that's the biggest pushback I get when I talk about this. I I made like a Instagram video about this and I'll send it to you. There are like hundreds of comments in there telling me that I'm so out of touch with reality because people okay. don't have time. You're privileged. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and, and I hear that. I hear that because I see my friends, especially those who have children. So to that, I say, um, if you can't do it every week, no problem. Put a bi-weekly 20 minute on a Sunday morning for yourself in the calendar, right? If you can't do it bi-weekly, start once a month. Make sure you just have it because once you start seeing the benefit and the joy of spending time with yourself, you're going to make time for it. And you can do it for 10 minutes a week. It doesn't have to be a 60 minute night out. Like it doesn't have to be that. Um, So that's my first thing. The second thing is I also get some pushback for this one, unfortunately, um, is in order to understand yourself. And in order to understand your patterns, you need to have data points about yourself. And how do we gather this data? We either do it through journaling. We can do it through audio journaling. So people who don't like to journal, um, and there's a lot of people, especially now, um, who don't want to write stuff. Um, I say audio journal it, you know, put it in a notes app. So if you can't journal, just do a word cloud, like a weekly word cloud with one prompt, like what was the highlight of my week or what did I really hate or something, any, but you need data points in order to become self-aware. It just, it won't happen otherwise. And the third way to get data about yourself is to go to therapy. Yeah. Which I know is not accessible to everyone. So. Well, now there's teletherapy, right? Like you can, I think there's an app I saw where you can. Oh, gosh, there's so many. Where you are. Yeah, 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 there's so many, yeah. Um, um, but yeah. One suggestion I would like to offer, too, just from my own personal experience, is just going for a walk around the block. And mm-hmm. the reason I like that, you know, without without listening to anything, um, I get some of my best reflections on walks. And it's, it's a process-oriented task in the sense that you have to go around the whole block to make it back to <laughs> Mm-hmm. to your house or to where you started. So there's like a built-in time allotment mm-hmm. that you can't mm-hmm. shorten like you could if you were sitting in your, you know, bedroom and mm-hmm. you just like, oh, I can't take this, you know, boredom any longer. Let me cut on the TV or something like that. When you're walking, you're just walking, you're noticing, and then obviously ideas and stuff start coming to you and you're like, oh, that's right. You have so many ahas and insights. So that's just mm-hmm. something I'd like to offer to people yeah. out there with me to this. No, I love that. Okay, so we, just a couple more questions. Uh, you mentioned uh, there's a section on self-worth, and you talk about low self-worth. 
And what's the relationship between toxic productivity and, and, and self-worth and how do you raise yourself? Well, actually, let's start with this. What is low self-worth? Obviously, yeah. we've all heard the term, but what does it actually mean? What are some of the symptoms yeah. and how do, you, how do you change that? Yeah. So self-worth is our inherent understanding of the value we bring to the world. It has nothing to do with external achievements or markers. That's self-esteem. So our self-esteem is connected to uh, like things that we achieve, right? And that's why self-esteem is variable throughout our life. We have high self-esteem because we got a great job, we got fired, we have low self-esteem, and that's natural. That's like a normal thing. Self-worth needs to be the value that you have within yourself that you feel confident in bringing to your relationships that is not related to any external achievements or external markers at all. So your self-worth has to be constant in a healthy state. It's meant to be constant. So whether you get fired or not, you can say, hey, I was a bad employee and I can change this or that, but it should never be, I'm a horrible human. I don't deserve to live anymore. I am so, I have no value in this world, right? That's when our self-worth is low. So when we think that, you know, we don't bring value to our relationships, people will be happier without us. Like nobody, nobody really cares what I have to say. It's not important what I think. Those are some markers of having low self-worth. And so, you know, what that can look like in, relationships across different domains of life is constantly abandoning yourself to make other people happy. So you might come across as the easygoing friend, the super, you know, oh, Isra doesn't have any opinions. Like she just go with the flow. She'll just go. She'll. It's whatever. Right. And you're not able to express your needs to other people without the fear that they will reject or abandon you. That's when you don't value yourself and what you're bringing. Um, and it's not a death sentence. It sounds very intense. Like I know that it's really a byproduct of, and, and I hate being the cliche therapist with a cardigan right now, but um, it's, it is a byproduct of how we were raised. If we were raised to believe that our value is contingent on how other people see us, that can really make this relationship between your opinion of me and my opinion of me. So, and it gets amplified through life in high school, especially, if, you know, if you've been bullied or anything like that, or you've internalized things that you feel shame about. And so the way self-worth, low self-worth connects with toxic productivity is that we use our productivity as a tool to lift our self-worth, to feel belonging, to feel accepted, to feel powerful, to feel like we have status. So the energy that should be going and lifting our self-worth inherently gets redirected into, I'm just going to do all of these things and then people will accept me. I'll always be needed, right? And and that's how we get into this productivity mindset and we overdo, we overcommit, we overfunction, we overwork, and then we burn out, we're resentful, we're miserable, we're bitter, we become unhealthy, and it impacts us in a very powerful way. If you're listening to this and you're a therapist or you're an accountant or a psychologist or some you have a profession and you have this idea that you feel is unique and it would be an amazing book. I just want to write this book. What advice would you give to people in that situation? Because obviously you were in that situation a few years ago. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? Like, do you nominate yourself as an author? Do you put together a book proposal? What was your experience like? So there's predominantly two ways books are published in through traditional publishing right now. One right. is you and this is like the most traditional way you write a little bit of a manuscript. It doesn't have to be fully full, depending on if it's fiction or nonfiction, you get an agent, right? The agent then takes your manuscript and they shop it around to publishing houses. And then you just query them. So you sent them emails, you sent them, uh, yeah, they don't do letters anymore, but However, you have to do your research on the agent you are looking at. 
So you have to make sure that they're interested in publishing books that, like the one that you have written. If you have a fiction book, don't query a nonfiction agent. And you can, there's a couple of websites that give you a list of agents. And often agencies will put out alerts saying, hey, this agent is open to taking manuscripts right now, or this agent is closed for the season. So find these like agencies in your area um, or in your niche, in your like whatever genre you are publishing in. Try to follow them on social media, engage with them a little bit so they have an idea of who you are. And when they're open, pitch them. And you can get, you know, pitches on ChatGPT. That's a very helpful tool. But there's, I've seen a couple of, um, Instagram account authors who actually provide support on this. And I've learned a lot from that. And then, you know, the agent goes, they pitch it, and then you get the book deal. The other way is what happened with me is if you are already putting your writing out in the world in the form of a newsletter or long form writing on Substack, Substack is a great tool for this. Publishers will find you. And so the publishers reached out to me because they had read my newsletter and, and so that's how and they were like, Hey, like, there's this topic. Do you have a proposal? I was like, let me, let me write one up for you. And then I pitched it to them and there's pros and cons to both. So you don't I, have an say, agent? I don't have an agent still. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so there is a pro and con to it. Right. So like the pro with having a publisher and writing it with them is, you know, that guaranteed this book is getting published. But mm -hmm. the con is you don't have an agent. You don't have your own editor, to everything or rate and all that stuff. Rate, even like form, style, cover, like all of that sits within the publisher. And so that's like the pro and con you're weighing on one side. The other side, you're writing without a concrete guarantee that this will be published. And sometimes that can take a really long time, but you're able to negotiate a higher book deal. You might be able to have more agency in a lot of different things. So it's really like where you're at in your writing career that d delineates how you want to do it. Is there anything you would do differently if you had to do it over again for your process? Um, I think that I would probably, for multitudes of reasons, I would probably want to work with a literary agent. I think that it would have been helpful for me to like have, because a literary agent works with a, your own editor to really flesh out. I think I did a lot of the fleshing out as I was writing it. And, and I think that that was like an interesting process for me. So I think the next time I want to do it differently just to see which process works better for me. So I think that's why I would want to do it. The Another thing I would, I would add for those people listening to this, who have an idea is you, you have a very, um, uh, a sizable social media mm -hmm. following. And if you do reach out to literary agents, the first thing they're going to do is look at your social media following. Mm -hmm. because it's a lot easier to sell you as an author if you have people who are already interested in following, you know, whatever it is that you're putting out into the world. So mm -hmm. all that to say, this is not to discourage you if you don't have a big following, but just start putting your writing out there, start a mm -hmm. newsletter, start becoming the thought leader that you're going to want to be if you want to secure a book deal. And maybe yes. just think of it in terms of like a two or three year process instead of this has to happen in the next six months. Yes, absolutely. It's definitely a time consuming process. And I will say that, you know, different social media platforms are different for specific reasons. Mm -hmm. I think Substack right now is the best place to put your writing out there for someone to see because all of the publishers, agents, editors that were on Twitter, what is now X, have kind of ported over to Substack in like the writer community. And I have a friend who is self-publishing on Substack, right? Yeah. And it's like a weekly uh, chapter gets released. And I mean, it's garnered a lot of attention because it's a very unique way of, of self-publishing because um, it's almost like in the way Charles Dickens wrote in every newspaper, parts of the story came out. Um, and so I think Substack is probably your best bet if you want to write a long form, you know, uh, book. Um, and I think Instagram and stuff is helpful as well, for right. sure. Yeah. Amazing. Toxic productivity, reclaim your time and emotional energy in a world that always demands more. Isn't that the truth? Mm -hmm. um, it's out now and everywhere books are sold. We'll put links to your 
profile and your website and your Substack and all that in the show notes. And thank you very much, Isra, for coming on and for sharing your story and for being willing to go off on all these tangents. <laughs> <laughs> the vacation fight. Yeah. And all the other tangents. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciated it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was a really fun conversation. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day, so make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really gonna love this one as well. And if you ever wanna see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.